welcome to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show with your spicy hosts, Tara and Sylvie. We come to you every episode with the goal of exposing, uncovering, and sharing what we know about SEX. This isn't your typical sex ed. Juicy sex talk is under-discussed, and we're doing what we can to change that. Sex is evolving. People are empowered more than ever to detach from cultural norms and design the erotic life they crave. And hey, if you're looking for more after the show, we invite you to get social. Our Instagram is the.sexed.show, and we would love for you to give us a follow and slide into our DMs. <laughs> oh, so this show has a new co-host. Please welcome Sylvie. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Sylvie brings an abundance of knowledge and expertise with training in neuroscience, somatic sex coaching, psychedelic integration, and doming. She is also a fellow practitioner in training with myself, so I think this duo is sure to be an abundance of sex-positive info. So why do people seek out somatic sex educators? What do sessions with sexological body workers look like? Who are professionals that work alongside these practitioners? We crack open our SSE diaries and share all of this and more on today's episodes. From discussions about soft cock to working with urologists, we cover all the impactful ways this work has changed people's lives. And today I am sitting and recording this podcast on the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes Blackfoot Confederacy, the Sutina Nation, and Stony Nakoda First Nation, and Northwest Métis Region 3. And I am an uninvited guest here on the lands of the Tamian Nation, otherwise known as Mountain View, California. And... As, as your new co-host, Tara, can I offer the somatic inquiry for today? Yes, please. I would love that. <laughs> awesome. So this one is called Head, Shoulders, Knees, and Toes, minus the head, shoulders, and knees. Okay. So basically toes, just, <laughs> just right. toes. Although if you don't have access to your toes or you don't have toes or sensation in your feet, please feel free to use another body part. I find that ears work pretty well as well. So whatever body part works for you. And if none of them work, then you can just listen in and that's totally fine too. Or fast forward. Yeah, or fast forward, <laughs> exactly. So wherever you are and whatever you're doing, whether you're sitting and your feet are planted on the floor or dangling in the air or whether you're walking or running around right now, whatever you're doing, just shift your attention to your toes right now. And I'd like you in your mind's eye to locate your big toe on your right foot. Just sense into it. Notice if you can locate it with your mind. Notice what it feels like when you just locate it with your mind. Now try to move just that toe without any of the other toes. Notice whether that feels easy or hard. Now see if you can locate the big toe on the other foot and try the same thing. First, locate it in your mind, build out its shape. Notice how that big toe is feeling today. If there's any buzzing sensation in it or a numbness or warmth or a cold anything that you notice about it at all. And when you're ready, try to move it, just that big toe. And now see whether you can pick out any individual toes from the three toes situated between your big toe and your pinky toe. Interestingly, um, I found that a lot of people find that it's quite hard to individually locate just one of these toes. And instead, most people often feel like the unit of three is all that they can get in their minds, but feel into whether that's true for you. Potentially try moving any individual toe in that three toe unit by itself. Even if it's just a tiny twitch, it still counts. Now notice your pinky, your pinky toe. Locate it in your mind's eye first and then see if you can move it on its own. 
separate from the others. Then take a deep breath into all of your toes and thank them for all the work they do and the challenges this exercise may have provided. Feel free to take a nice big grounding breath and come back to us here as we continue the podcast. Ooh. Thank you, Sylvie. How was that for you, Tara? How are your toes today? Yeah, my pinky toes, I don't feel them much. They're really, really small. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, yeah. Uh, I actually, I had frostbite a long time ago on one, one toe and like one of the ones in the three middle. And I can feel that one all the time. It's like hypersensitive. Cool. So uh, that one was actually really easy to pick out. So my big toe and that one in, in particular, but I definitely don't give much attention to my, my feet or my toes. Yeah. We often don't, right. Even though we spend a lot of time standing on them and using them for so many things. Yeah. Yeah. Thank so. you feet. Yeah. Thank you feet. <laughs> thank you toes. <laughs> Oh, so yeah, like I mentioned in the intro, Sylvie is coming on as a co-host with me on the show, which I'm super thrilled about. It means you get that bonus sexy British accent to <laughs> soothe you as we delve into the depths of discomfort around topics that no one else wants to openly talk about. Right, Tara? <laughs> yeah. And the fact that you're another SSE practitioner like me is just, that makes things juicy like we can really dive into stuff together and I think even learn from each other too because we both have different styles and ways of doing things and um I think it's yeah it's super super exciting yeah um I'm excited to be on here and blast you all with quite a lot of nerdy neuroscience and then you know have Tara balance us out with uh <laughs> with some with some more practicality and yeah. And everything, all the goodness that, that Tara has on this podcast. I'm super excited to be on it. Yeah. I definitely appreciate the British accent. Even my <laughs> partner, when he was editing, he's like, where is she from? I love the accent. <laughs> like, well, I, I mean, do you want to share where you're from? Oh, it's, it's really complicated. I, I grew up in a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. Um, my, my mom is actually Irish. My dad is from Wales. Uh, I was born in Brussels in Belgium and grew up there for the most part and then moved to Israel as a teenager and then moved to the U.S. later on. So I have lived all over. That's very cool. I bet you've seen a lot of things too, just like when it comes to relationships and sex and dating and coming of age across the, across the ocean. It's, it can be different. It is very different. I find that American culture and North American culture in general is is very different from Europe, especially when it comes to sex. And our sex ed is very different. We also have less body shame, I think. Not everywhere in Europe, but in a lot of places in Europe. I remember going to American beaches for the first time and being surprised that there were no topless sunbathers. And then mm -hmm. when I asked about it, people were like, of course not, that's illegal. And I was like, oh, why? And people were like, what What do you mean, why? Like, you can't just go around showing your boobs off. And I was like, well, you're not showing them off, but you're getting an even tan. Why, why would you not do that? And yes. in Europe, you know, we grew up with that being a really normal thing. People go to mixed saunas when they don't even, you know, know the other people in the sauna. And it's, you know, it's totally normal and people don't freak out about it. So I think... That was such an interesting time coming to America and realizing that people have a lot of body shame and body hangups here that we don't necessarily have in Europe. It's not to say that we don't have body hangups in Europe at all, but I think that bodies are, for the most part, possibly less sexualized. That's and, exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. 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 And treated more as like, you know, normal. Actually, in Canada, you can go topless. Like I can go topless in my backyard. There's in, but you'd freeze your tits off because it's Canada <laughs> in the winter, in the summer, like it's 40 degrees Celsius. Some days it's hot. Fair enough. But right now it's, it is freeze your tit off 
winter. So <laughs> please, please don't go topless snow bathing outside, Tara. No, no, no. I don't want to. I did I did a cold plunge once. Mm-mm, never again. That was way too much for my nervous system. Can do the Wim Hof breathing. <laughs> oh yeah, that's yeah. No, no, no. So I thought we could kind of get into a conversation about why people come and see us. Like what are some of the reasons that they might show up in our in our inbox or message us on social media that those are usually the two typical ways people reach out to me and just like kind of share that with listeners. Yeah, that it, that would be a great thing to start with. So I actually don't get too many people messaging me from Instagram but they do come to my website. And also I work with various medical professionals who will send people my way. So pelvic floor therapists are great referrers for me. Also regular therapists and midwives, uh, lots of different kinds of professionals that work, osteopaths, also chiropractors. So lots of people that work with people's bodies and who understand the value of having a professional touch another human's body and the stories that our bodies have to tell. And so people do come to me to help rewire their neural circuitry for enhanced sexual satisfaction. They come to me with pain with intercourse, anorgasmia, so the inability to orgasm, erectile dysfunction, lack of intimacy in their relationships, just not being able to have the amount of sexual satisfaction that they're looking for, or sometimes just lack of desire altogether. What about you, Tara? Yeah, I would have to say those are probably the the main things I found. Like I haven't been offering sessions for a long time. It's been maybe a couple of months now. And that seems to be primarily the the things people are messaging me me about, lack of desire decreased intimacy in relationships, a lot of common sexual concerns, primarily like premature ejaculation and erectile dysfunction. Those seem to be the the big ones, definitely. And I find more men right now messaging me and reaching out for services. And there's been a few trans bodies too, which I'm really excited about the possibility of working with, with them. Yeah. Not many professionals. I live in a very conservative (laughs) place in Canada. And most professionals, when I talk to them, you know, I have my acupuncture, I have my chiropractor, I'm a massage therapist, I have a naturopath. They're like, what, what are you doing? What is somatic sex education? What's this body work? So it's been a lot of just explaining this to them and seeing if maybe there's a potential for referrals, but I'm hoping like by doing things like this podcast, we're able to expand professionals' minds to the healing that can take place when you work with a practitioner like us. Absolutely. I've actually also found that giving professionals a session so that they can understand what we do is sometimes extremely helpful because mm. I've explained it. It's it's some sort of alchemy happens when you touch someone's body So we can explain it with words all we want and people sort of look at us either blankly or (laughs) with with this quizzical look or in horror, right? Whatever it is that people sort of look at us with this expression of you do what? (laughs) And then, or or sometimes, you know, and and depending on who the audience is, we we might choose to share more or less about what we do. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I'm just going to tell people, come in for a session. I'll show you what I do. And I send them my intake form ahead of time, which sort of gives me a better idea of how to work with them. And it gives them a better idea of what what I do. And they then come in. And after the session, what I've typically found is that those people will then turn around and say, wow, Hmm. okay, did not understand what this was before just having the session. And now I totally get it. Because it's profound when somebody is. is touching your body and emotions are coming up and those emotions are being given space and are being held and that you're actually following pleasure. I think a lot of people don't understand what it means to follow pleasure in their body because we go to 
pelvic floor therapists if we have pain. Mm-hmm. We go to trauma therapists if we're having, you know, episode, traumatic triggering episodes that are stopping us from progressing in our lives. We go to regular therapists because, again, we have pain points in our lives that we need to discuss with other people. We go to urologists because we're having certain issues with incontinence or our bladder. There's so many reasons why we go to therapists, and most of them revolve around pain and discomfort. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're not experiencing pain and discomfort, but we're not experiencing ecstasy, joy, and pleasure, we don't know where to take that to. We don't know how to ask for, well, things are fine, but I'd love them to be amazing. And that's where we can come in as well, because we don't just deal with dysfunction. We can, of course, help deal Mm -hmm. with dysfunction. And we work really well with pelvic floor therapists and trauma therapists and regular therapists and neurologists and chiropractors and osteopaths. We, We work very, very well with all of those therapists. And at the same time, we also do something that is quite different from what they do because we are not focused on just taking away someone's pain. Mm -hmm. We are focused on them experiencing pleasure and experiencing it possibly in new ways than they've ever experienced it before and building those new neural pathways in their minds so that they can experience things in a brand new way. Yeah, that's, of course, Sylvie, her (laughs) science-y explanation. But one thing you would, that was a really good point that you made is that as practitioners, we are trauma informed. And the reality is most pelvic floor therapists aren't trauma informed. So if you've had like a history of sexual abuse, it might be really triggering going in and seeing a pelvic floor therapist for the first time. It's super clinical. And actually my dog, he goes to a physiotherapist for his leg right now. She is like the number one canine physio in the world. She she just got an award and she started off working on humans. And I was chatting with her about this work and She was like, I can see how beneficial this is because I never learned how to be trauma informed. And it, the first time that I went to a pelvic floor therapist, it was so clinical and so scary. And my body was so tight and it was laying on this sheet of paper with paper covering my legs. And there's no music. There's nothing on the ceiling. There's nothing neat to look at. And she's like, it was, it was not a great experience. And I probably didn't get as much as I could have out of it. Yeah. And I think the other thing about going to see a pelvic floor therapist, and again, I love pelvic floor therapists. I refer people to them often and they refer people to me often, which is great, but they come from a fundamentally different mindset. So for example, we'll take one example of uh, people who suffer from vaginismus, where vaginismus is extremely painful for people who are trying to have intercourse. The muscles literally close close down around around anything trying to enter and form this it feels like a a sort of a wall Mm -hmm. that there is a wall there that is impenetrable and what a pelvic floor therapist will do with people who have vaginismus is they will give them dilators which are a set of you know they, they basically look like long well, the first, the, the smaller sides look like, you know, like long chopstick style things, but they look like long dildos. Uh, they're quite long and they vary in thickness up until uh, about the size of a, of a regular penis. And they will tell people to go home and try inserting them from small to large. Uh, and, you know, every time you go and see them, you tell them what number you managed to insert that week and how comfortable that was. And here's my problem with that. We are forcing bodies to open when that body may very well have a reason and a need to shut down. Mm -hmm. And the whole fact of trying to force something into someone, for me, even if, if they want that, even if they come to you and they tell you, I I really love my partner, I still want to have sex with them penetrative sex, right? Because that's the only kind of sex a lot of people (laughs) recognize as being real sex, which is, again, we have a different framing. 
Mm -hmm. someone comes into us and says, oh, we have vaginismus, we can't have sex. We will question that and say, well, what are you defining as sex, right? right. But if they say, no, 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 penetration, I, I need to have penetrative sex with my partner. Please help me. And a pelvic floor therapist will say, absolutely, I will help you. You'll come in, we'll do manual therapy, and then you'll go home and you'll use your dilators. And slowly, slowly, we will pry you open. We'll force you open. That sounds right? so, like, even when you're saying that, my 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 vagina, my vulva is like, do not pry me open. <laughs> right? And that's the thing. And they're not asking any questions about, well, was there something that happened to you early on in life that may have given your body a reason to want to protect itself like this? Mm-hmm. And is that reason still valid? And is there a lot of stress in your life? And how do you breathe when you're, mm-hmm. you know, and how much warm up are you having? They don't ask those questions. They're just there to say, right, there's a problem with, you know, getting through this, you know, getting through this blockage. Fine, we'll do that. And it's, we're not just bodies to be pried open. We are holistic beings that have thoughts and feelings and emotions and sensations and reasons why our nervous system might want to shut something down if it feels scared or anxious or worried. And what we do as sexological body workers is that we would never try and pry someone open. We would never try and force something in where it felt uncomfortable. When our clients tell us that something feels uncomfortable, we ask them if they'd like to stop because we don't want them to endure anything. Right. And often what I'll find is that people will grit their teeth and say, no, 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 it's fine. Keep going. And I'll say, no, no, that's, we don't want you to endure, right? This is not a medical exam. This is not, you're not the gynecologist mm-hmm. putting your feet in stirrups and you're not just a piece of flesh here. You're a human and you're enduring something right now. And we don't want you to endure. We want you to follow pleasure. And that can change so much for people. It's a just very different kind of experience that we're offering. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I had a uh, pelvic floor therapist who attempted to pry my butt open. <laughs> that was ouch, so awful. I only did after that. I actually never went back. And yeah, like there's still lingering trauma from that. It was not a pleasurable experience at all. That sounds awful. Yeah, there was a lot of enduring. And then, you know, the recommendation was to go home and just like try and get like my baby finger in and then work up to like a larger finger and then like a butt plug. And I had no interest in doing that. Like it wasn't until we started learning about like rosebud and anal massage in our curriculum that I started practicing on myself and it was, that was so nice. I'm like, I don't even need penetration to feel pleasure in my anus. I really don't. And if it happens, great, that's a bonus. But I think like deframing the fact that it needs to be penetrated, that alone was huge for me. Yeah. And decentering like what their traditional way is that you would experience sex with that part of your body is like uh, empowering. Absolutely. And anal massage, even external anal massage can be such an amazing tool for the nervous system to downregulate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The nerves around, around your anus specifically really help you to get into your parasympathetic nerve system, nervous system. And they really just down regulate your whole system so it can be really soothing but obviously trying to shove something in somewhere that doesn't want it in is never regulating for a nervous system it's incredibly dysregulating and it's immediately going to put your body on defense and we're never feeling sexy when we're also feeling defensive and nervous and anxious Mm -hmm. that is those are not sexy feelings to have So it is so important to not force things. Yeah. Lesson learned. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. No, I mean, haven't we all been there, right? With any kind of medical exam or even at the dentist, right? Where we just dread it. Yeah. And we just lie there thinking, oh my God, just, yeah, yeah, just finish, just finish. 
right? And lots of people get through sex that way too, where they think, okay, it's just going to be 10 minutes and I will just grit my teeth and we'll get through it. And we don't want people to be enduring that. Sex is supposed to be amazing. It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be pleasurable. Masturbation is supposed to be fun and pleasurable. And if any of those things are not fun and pleasurable and you find yourself thinking, I'll just get through it and get it over with, that might be a really good time to call your local sex board. <laughs> yes. Take notes, people. <laughs> um, we're going to actually pause for a quick little break. And when we come back, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about, oh, some of the most impactful work that we've done. So stay tuned. Welcome back. We are in segment two of this wonderful episode, having so much fun talking about, well, now we're kind of getting into like the diary of the SSE. We're penetrating it. <laughs> we're penetrating it. We're going to share. Plowing the depths. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. We were going to share some, some s- stories of work that we've done, impactful things that felt good to us too, because this work can be really rewarding at times for me, at least. I love it. Yeah, it is. Best job I've ever had, hands down. Yeah. Yeah. I've come a long way since oil and gas. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Oh yeah. So I think we'll just take turns if that sounds good to you, Sylvie. Absolutely. Okay. Um, tell, tell me, I I know that you've had uh, a story of someone who came to you for spinal damage. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, they were in the army and they did a lot of deep sea diving in their job. I don't know exactly what it was. There wasn't much background with that. But through that, I think like when you start to dive deeper and deeper, it isn't good for your body to do this over and over and over. And you can experience like nerve issues and issues with your joints and your spine. And I think it had something to do with fluid in the spine. And because of that, this person ended up experiencing nerve damage in their spine. They got surgery for it and obviously no longer were in the military, in the army. And a result of this surgery was that they weren't able to have an erection anymore and mostly experience life and pleasure and arousal with a soft cock. And I mean, if you know how society views sex, you know, traditionally it's a rock hard cock and it's penetrating over and over and over. Like this is what we typically will see in porn, which Unfortunately, most people use as sex ed and it like, let's be real porn is it's like watching a movie. It's performative. People are getting paid and it it is by no means what real life sex is like. And so this person felt really defeated and like demasculated and just lost. They felt like they lost a part of themselves, which is totally fair. I, I, I understand that. And so we worked on decentering hard cock and really finding pleasure in soft cock and learning about arousal in different areas of their body and learning how to be in partnership with a person when you don't have a hard cock and you know, there's fingers, there's mouths, there's toys, and you don't really need a hard raging cock to experience the pleasures of intimacy and sex. And so that was pretty much a game changer for me because that was one of the first people I ever worked with. And this was also virtual. This wasn't in person either. So it was, yeah, it was you know, for somebody to trust you enough to come to you and be that open was that in itself, like was, you know, very touching. And I took 
that's this very, like the space that I held very seriously for this person. And yeah, I just felt that was like one of the most impactful. Actually, I would probably say that's, that is the most impactful sessions person that I've worked with. And I bet that person was so happy that they found you, Tara. Hmm, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, I haven't seen them in a long time, so I, I think they're doing okay. But yeah, like where else are you going to get that sort of support from, right. you know, like you, you're not going to get it from a doctor. They said they went to the doctor, they tried all these creams and pills and nothing worked. So um, yeah, finding pleasure in different ways and it's fun to get creative in sex. It's part of what sex is. Absolutely. Yeah. And I actually have a, a similar soft cock story to yours. And also I often get referred people with prostate who've had prostate uh, removal surgery, prostatectomies, and they've either had the whole of their prostate or part of their prostate removed. And sometimes that doesn't actually impact a person's erection, depending on how, I mean, some people go to amazing surgeons and the sur surgeries are getting better and better. And so often now there is less nerve da damage than there used to be. But even going back just a few years, if you went in for a prostatectomy, oftentimes you'd come out with impaired uh, erectile function. Uh, oh, you definitely wow. wouldn't be able to ejaculate anymore. And it really did impact people's sex lives. And I have been getting referrals from, from pelvic floor therapists for men with prostate cancer or, and prostate removal surgery. And oftentimes, like you said, they come in and they are just mourning the loss of this hard cock and the myth of what it is to be a man. And the first thing we do before we do anything with the soft cock, which by the way, can feel very pleasurable. But before we do any of that, we talk about what is the relationship between hardness and being a man. And it's quite interesting because I asked this to a client recently who said, you know, if, if I can't get an erection, I just, I do, I feel very emasculated. And I said, why? And he said, because, you know, my penis, it's my manhood. And I said, what makes it your manhood? Like what, what is it about your penis that makes you a man? And he was like, well, it just does. Like I'm a hunter gatherer, you know? And I was like, do you hunt and gather with your penis? And he was like, well, no. And I was like, well, okay, if I cut off your arms, would you be less of a man? And he was like, well, no. And I was like, but you would hunt and gather with your arms. You just told me that being a man means being a hunter-gatherer. But if I cut off your arms and you couldn't hunt and gather anymore, you'd still feel like a man. But you don't hunt and gather with your penis, but because it can't get hard, you feel like less of a man. And that was really interesting to see them try and try and explain that and also try and understand the absurdity of that, right? That we have equated hardness in society with being a man and not just physical hardness, although there's a lot of physical hardness that we expect from men, but we also expect them to be emotionally hard in mm -hmm. society. And deconstructing that idea of hardness is really a first step because there is so much pleasure and tenderness that can come from softness and exploring what soft cock pleasure can feel like and exploring what it means to bring softness into masculinity and having masculinity alongside softness as well. Um, so that that's something that I love working on with the men who come to my practice who have either erectile dysfunction uh, because they just have erectile dysfunction or that because they've had surgery, which has caused that or some sort of an injury, which has caused that. Um, there's also lots to be done with those men on how else they might experience orgasms. So again, from the neuroscience perspective, there's no reason why we can't reprogram the brain to experience orgasm in a different way. And by the way, soft cocks can experience orgasm. They can also ejaculate. It's slightly different when you've had your prostate removed. But if you have not had your prostate removed, you can actually have an ejaculatory orgasm with a soft cock. There's also just a ton of pleasure to be had with or without orgasm from soft cock massage and just pleasuring yourself with a soft cock. 
uh, can feel great. I've also had men try wearing strap-ons and feeling into the strap-on as an energetic cock while their partner either uh, massages their soft penis and gets penetrated, the partner then can get penetrated by the the strap-on mm -hmm. while they're also touching the soft cock and the man can then experience an orgasm energetically in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that that can be quite the amazing experience when they realize that they can actually achieve orgasm, not even through their own penis, which is pretty outstanding. So there is a lot to be done and intense pleasure that can be had outside of the realm of the soft cock and outside of the realm of regular genital orgasm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's funny because you go to like a traditional doctor or something and these things are just never brought up and you know so many people with penises who don't get hard are feeling this every day which is actually kind of sad you know yeah, it's awful <laughs> but there's no help right you know when you go to your doctor and you say what can I do like I'm 38 years old <laughs> And I was injured in a scuba diving accident. Like, will I ever have a sex life again? And your doctor says, well, at least you're alive, right? right? Like, that's so dismissive and unhelpful. Yeah. And there is no one that these people can go to to help with that. And their doctors are not helping them with that. Mm -hmm. There's things like, you know, they'll give them some, sometimes they can give them some medication, which actually doesn't work for everyone. And sometimes they'll give them uh, injections that they can inject right into their penis right before sex. Again, not incredibly sexy, not something that particularly mm -hmm. gets you into the mood, having to jam a massive needle into your penis right before having sex. It will work for some people and other people will say, absolutely not, I can't do that or I won't do that or this doesn't work for me. And for those people, what is the solution? And, and, and it can be dangerous. Is, it yeah. can be dangerous injecting yourself. I had somebody who broke their penis oh my gosh. with injection because it didn't go soft after and they had to go to the hospital and so much damage was done to the tissue and they ended up getting um, a surgery actually. So that like, I don't know if you've heard of it where you can pump your actual penis. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know the exact surgery. So that wow. he can get hard now because he injected his penis. To yeah. get hard. I do know a lot of people do use penis pumps. And it's funny because I remember the first time I heard that, I was like, what, like in Austin Powers? I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I've actually spoken to quite a few men who've used penis pumps and they've had great success with them. Some of them have even said that they much prefer it to using drugs like Viagra mm -hmm. or Cialis because using a penis pump, first of all, it doesn't, the effect, it lasts actually quite a long time, but it's not artificial and there's more sensation in it. And for some reason, it just, for the, from the small sample of men I've spoken to about penis pumps, they've told me that it, it feels a lot better than when they pop a Viagra. And it's safer. Like Viagra isn't if you're drinking and doing recreational drugs, you really shouldn't be doing Viagra or Cialis. It also gives you a stuffy nose. Did you know that? Because your <laughs> nose has erectile tissue in it. And so Viagra, um, it, because because it's a, a vasodilator, which means that it it allows blood to, to enter your erectile tissues, it does the same thing to the erectile tissue in your nose which is why if you've ever seen anyone who's popped a Viagra, typically their nose is incredibly stuffy because the erectile tissue in their huh. nose gets completely saturated with blood and then they just start talking like they have a cold. <laughs> so if you're partying and popping Viagra and doing cocaine, that is a mess for your nose. A huge mess. <laughs> Poor nose. Oh my God. Can you imagine that nose, what it would look like? I can imagine it being all red. Oh, that's what I was like thinking. <laughs> Oh God, now I need to touch my nose. Hi, nose. <laughs> oh man. Oh. Thanks, erectile tissue nose. Um, yeah. Do you want to are you ready to move 
out of. Oh yeah. No, tell me the story about that couple that took your program. Cause that was yeah. also a really cool story that you told me recently. And I think the readers will love it. The readers will love it. The listeners will love it. The readers will love it. Well, some so, people might be reading if there's closed that's captioning. True. That's true. So Tara, tell me the story of that couple who took your course. Yeah, they, uh, there were a couple I actually met in person at one of the, re- one of the resorts that we went to a-, a while ago. Wonderful couple. They were part of like the non-monogamous community. And I think they were married like somewhere like 10, 12 years. And so when I first did my relationship by design program, I sent out emails to people that they did coaching with me before to prep to go to this resort. So I sent emails out to people I've worked with before offering this and they were like, yeah, sign us up. And I was just like, oh my God. Okay, sweet. And we had so much fun working together. It was virtual again, over six sessions. So we did six virtual sessions. The first one I combined. So it's like three hours. It's quite intense. The first, the first session. And yeah, they just, they had never done any somatic work before, but they were really open to it. They were, I I don't want to say like woo woo, because they weren't really woo woo, but they were, you know, not close-minded to that sort of stuff. You know, when I'm like, Hey, I'm going to guide you into this erotic trance. They're like, okay, cool. And they walked away from that, having a better sense of each other and their somatic bodies, which I thought was really, really cool. And if you want, like, maybe I can read their little testimonial. Cause I, was I would like, love that. Read it. <laughs> Tara has been a dream facilitator in our somatic journey, being both new to the process and values of a somatic practice. It could have felt overwhelming or intimidating. Instead, it felt intriguing, liberating, enlivening. Oh my God, my dyslexia. Getting to learn about myself and my partner in new ways feels amazing. After 10 years of partnership, to be able to have a deeper level of understanding and intimacy with one another feels incredible. She was so compassionate, encouraging each of us, and has a beautiful way of holding space for this type of deeply intimate work. Yeah. Wow. Um, <laughs> and you want to know, it's it's funny because the Wheel of Consent stuff was the stuff that really blew their mind, like doing the bossy massage and the wanting game and waking up the hands. Like, this is stuff that it seems so easy to us as practitioners because that's what we learn at the very beginning of this training. But for somebody who has never been exposed to that type of work and exercises and and games, they're just like, it's, it's fun. It's super engaging. And you're learning so much about yourself and your partner along the way. Absolutely. Wow. What an incredible incredible space you held for them. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. I loved it. And so I'll be offering, I I, I'm offering it all the time, but I'm going to be actually doing a live group one. So I'm going to have a few different couples. I'm hoping that will sign up and do a live, a live group relationship by design program. When are you starting that? February 2nd. Cool. February 2nd. So I don't, is this going to be posted by then? No. So, okay. Yeah. I'm going to do a little CTA call to action. (laughs) Check out my website, sign up for that. (laughs) Sign up for it just as it's already started. (laughs) Yes. Oh yeah. So I just thought I would mention that because that was, you know, I love working with couples and that was the first couple that I worked with doing this type of work and yeah, just blew my mind. It's so fun working with couples. I think they are, uh, it's where I find my joy a lot of times. It's definitely my niche in this, in this work. And it's so important because again, people often do come to us when they are having relational difficulties and a lot of those relational difficulties, some of them can be intimacy issues and others can be physical issues. And nobody ever teaches us how to touch another person's body. Mm -hmm. Right. We don't learn that in sex ed. We no. learn we learn about how to prevent pregnancy and STIs. It's kind of like going to a cookery course where they tell you how to not catch salmonella. Right. right? 
They yes. don't teach you how to make, you know, 50 different types of chicken. Chicken they just cordon you, bleu. <laughs> right? And we're teaching people the actual recipe for how to have something delicious, not just how to not catch an STI or how to not get pregnant. Right? So, and it's different. Nobody teaches someone like, this is how you need to touch when you want to be passionate. And this is how you need to touch when you want to be tender. And this is how you convey attentiveness when you're looking into another person's eyes. People don't get that education and they either pick it up along the way. Some of them do and some of them don't. And it's not their fault that they haven't picked it up. They need to learn and they can only really learn that in relational space, which is something that we can provide or it's something that we can provide as a, as a space holder for them and their partner. And it's so, so important, the work that you're doing with couples. It's incredible. And you don't have to have an issue to, to discover more about intimacy and partnership and what you desire and how to speak your limits. It's like, they didn't have any issues. They had a great sex life. They were happy with each other and they were just like, Hey, yeah, like maybe this is, we like Tara, maybe this is a great way to just like invest in our relationship and it, it paid off for them. Amazing. Yeah. Sylvie, do you have, do you have one more that you'd like to share before we take our next little break? Sure. So I would say, I mean, we've, we've spent a long time, we talked about men and soft cocks and we've talked about couples and why they come to us. And I think it's also important to highlight that a lot of people do come and seek out sex bods postpartum. So after having a baby, birth and pregnancy, well, pregnancy and birth, right? Chicken and egg. Um, uh, pregnancy and birth have such massive implications for what happens to your body. And it's a transition that changes so many different things, not just <laughs> the distribution of weight on your muscles in your body and your pelvic floor and just all kinds of things and blood flow in general. But afterwards, sometimes people have tearing. Sometimes they have scar tissue from things like episiotomies where they were cut open to allow the baby's head to come out or even from C-sections. And I've met a lot of people who say that, you know, they don't have, they shouldn't have any problem with intercourse because they had a C-section, but scar tissue is really tricky. Scar tissue can grow and stick inside the body in really weird places and can really attach quite far down and can wrap itself around various, you know, structures and muscles. And, and there's the fascia that, that doesn't get enough respect in our culture there's so many things that can happen during pregnancy and birth that can make sex painful. And so resolving that when there's scar tissue to be tended to, using palpation, using castor oil, allowing for that scar to speak its story, which sounds super woo-woo. And I'm a neuroscientist, <laughs> so I don't like the woo, but I have noticed it time and time again that sometimes when you palpate someone's scar, the story comes. And when the story gets spoken out, sometimes that scar just relaxes a little bit, like it can let itself go. And it's really interesting. I'm doing Ellen Heed's amazing stream course right now. So stream is scar tissue remediation, education, and management. And Ellen Heed is an absolute legend in the sex bod world and also in the scar tissue world. She is just an absolutely incredible educator. She uh, has taught us as sex bonds all about castor oil and how we use castor oil packs on scars. But again, the kind of work that she teaches now is all about how scar tissue itself has consciousness and the body can choose. So when you get a scar, depending on you know, your, your biomechanics and your nutrition and your stress levels and all kinds of things that are going on for you in your body, your body chooses what kind of collagen to use to make mm -hmm. your scar. And there's about 28, I think, different types of collagen that the body can choose to use. And some of them are crapper than others, basically. Wow. Some of them are not awesome collagens and some of them are much better collagens. And depending on the state that your body is in when it gets the scar, and how your nervous system responds afterwards, that's the type of scar tissue that your body will use. And they can also 
be improved and resolved if we tackle factors that are stressing you out or that if you're eating poorly or whatever else. So there is a lot that can be done to resolve scar tissue and to make sex less painful if scar tissue or any kind of birth injury or trauma was the root of that. And so I very much enjoy working with postpartum clients to see if we can get them through the transition and back to having a wonderfully full and fulfilling intimate life. It's, I am so happy you touched on that because I was around six moms last weekend and we were at a Christmas party and I was telling them what I was doing, you know, talking about some like sex education and how working with people who have birthed children, how that impacts their body. And they're all like, yeah, you know, if I jump on a trampoline, I'm going to pee. Sometimes I have pain from this. And I'm like, yeah, like that's not normal. (laughs) I mean, it sadly is normal, but it's not something you have to live with. Yes. Great way of putting that. That's Mm -hmm. what I hate about the culture that we're in right now is that it's turned into the butt of everyone's jokes. You literally can't watch a comedy special about motherhood without someone making a joke about peeing themselves. Right. It is literally the butt of every single mom comedy joke. And it's not a joke. Incontinence is absolutely not a joke. And it can 100% be worked on very easily yeah. by a pelvic floor therapist. I mean, just in Europe, it is mandatory at six weeks to go to a pelvic floor therapist what and yeah it's just part of post-birth recovery you go to a pelvic floor therapist and in this country you have to beg to see a pelvic floor therapist and then you have to fight your insurance company to pay for it well not in Canada but in in the U.S. that is definitely the case and and people just aren't going to see pelvic floor therapists as much as they should postpartum yeah and it would save so much trouble later on in life if you would just go now like and if you haven't been to a pelvic floor therapist and you have had a baby even if you had a baby a long time ago please go and see a pelvic floor floor therapist because there's probably lots that can be done even now right and actually one thing I heard was um these my friends they're like well where do you where do you go for that and I'm like well you can go to your doctor and ask for a referral or literally almost any physical therapy clinic in where I live, they have a pelvic floor therapist right? that works there. And so I'm like, just look at your local top five physical therapy places you would visit and you know, go on Google, look at the clinics. And typically one of the people there is a pelvic floor therapist. So it's, it's easy to find, but it's wildly under talked about yeah under discussed um okay we are getting close to time so we're gonna quickly go to a a little music break and then when we come back we have some instagram questions that people asked so stay tuned All right. Welcome back. We are in the last segment, Instagram Q&A. I always like getting these. (laughs) And I like that I wrote them down and then Sylvie did the answers on here. And (laughs) usually I'd leave it. I'm like, I'll just answer it in the moment. So that's super helpful. Thanks, Sylvie. You're welcome. Love love the type A. (laughs) Oh, for so once I was for once I was semi-organized. <laughs> I'm never organized. So. What really? That surprises me. <laughs> it surprises me too, <laughs> and disappoints me. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Okay, we're each gonna pick one. Oh my God, I love your answer for this. How many SSEs slash sexological body workers are there? Sylvie writes, not enough. <laughs> In all caps. <laughs> Period. <laughs> I would it have is, to say it's true because I there's only two in Alberta. Me it is and so annoying. Rhea. 
it's it's very frustrating because I would be going for more sessions and I also wish like insurance covered it I don't understand why insurance won't cover it because it has the word sex in it that's why (sighs) and because unless sex is for procreation then it's not right it's for procreation not recreation and insurance companies ain't gonna be paying for recreation I'm giving it 10 10 years max and it will be oh I hope so. At least, hopefully, in Canada. My number one US. question from people: Are you covered by insurance? No. Yes. Same here. <laughs> oh, can you make I it s- cheaper? No. <laughs> yeah, I don't think people understand how much we invest into the work that we do. No. Like not not only are we part of like the association and going through the institute, a lot of us have other different like different modalities that we've also worked in and you know for me a big one is like the non-monogamy and just the experience of that and being able to work with couples on that and I know for you you've you have quite a few a boatload of trainings <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm never gonna stop doing training yeah yeah exactly but so yeah there are not enough of us and if you would like to be a sex bod and this is a career that lights you up please get in touch so we can send you information on how you could get certified and help us all out because there are not enough of us and there are so many people who need us. Twinkle. Sylvie, do you want to pick the next question? Yeah. So how do we decide what people we work with? So that that's interesting because every practitioner is going to have their own answer to that question right? Mm-hmm. Cause it's in, it's individual. It's just like asking any kind of uh, therapist or practitioner, how they decide what people they're going to work with. I would say that typically as a rule and in our training, we're trained to work with all bodies, all abilities, all genders, and pretty much anyone willing to do the work and take the work seriously. And when I say take the work and take, you know, take the work seriously, It means you're not coming to us for a happy ending massage, right? You're not coming to lie down, bliss out, close your eyes and, you know, have, have an orgasm and then put on your clothes and leave. That is not what we do. I mean, some of, sometimes it can look a little bit like that, but what we're doing is really deep work on, it's a transformative experience. And just like when you go into any kind of therapy, you need to be putting in your part and you need to be willing to do the work. So it actually doesn't matter what body type you have or, you know, why you're even coming to us. But if you're not willing to do the work, you will get less out of the experience. Yeah. You might think you might not be getting less out of the experience, but I guarantee you, you are getting less out of the experience if you're not willing to put in your part of the work. Mm hmm. Does that align with you, Tara? Yeah, I I would have to say putting in the work is a really important aspect of it and understanding what I do and that it's not, like you said, a happy ending. And I do a lot of vetting with the people. Like I, I set up, I do a very thorough intake form and then set up a discovery call. And from there, I can kind of figure out if, okay, this person will get the most out. Like, because like you said, it's pricey. It can add up. It's not like one session and you're magically fixed. Usually it's consecutive sessions to, to really feel like you've been held and reached the thing I put in brackets that you're looking for. So yeah, there's a lot of vetting with that. And there has been people in that vetting process who are like, I just want an orgasm. And have a pretty woman touching me. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, well, that's not really what I offer. So thanks for trusting me in this. And maybe here are some people who offer tantric and erotic massages in the city. But it's a little bit deeper than that with with what we do. A lot of the choice in voice, I only offer a one-way touch. So I'm the only person touching. I don't offer a two-way touch. And yeah, I'll stay clothed and I'll wear gloves while I'm touching your genitals. And it it's a very professional setting for me. And that's what I want. Not every 
SSE and not every sexological body worker works like, like me. Yeah. And it is, I mean, that we have such profound ethical boundaries. I think if you, if you go on somaticsexeducators.com, you can also read about the association and uh, also our ethical boundaries and everything else, but it really is a training that is so profound and so deep when it comes to ethics and boundaries. And again, you are going to a trained professional. We have been trained, we practice, we take things incredibly seriously. It is not a trivial matter. And we're dealing with things that are deeply personal and deeply vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And people are trusting us to hold that space for them and to you know, having someone you don't know touch your body in an intimate way is a real level of trust. And we have to move at the speed of that trust. So being able to work with people who respect that speed and who don't try and rush us and who also don't try and rush themselves is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully that kind of answers that question. It was pretty... <laughs> We have a lot to say about that, apparently. Maybe we'll do an episode on that. <laughs> it's such a good question. Whoever asked it, we'll do a we'll do an episode on that at some point. It's a good question. Yeah. And also keeping in mind, every practitioner is different. We're like snowflakes. <laughs> yes, exactly. We're all we all have, bring our own beauty and difference, and that's part of the fun, and it's all celebrated. Um, yeah, so we are going to wrap up. Thank you to all the listeners for tuning in to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show. If you're looking for more ways to connect, you can get social with us. The show's Instagram is the.sexed.show and our individual Instagrams are Sex Ed for the Modern Bed and Sex and Sensibility. But the E in the sex is a three. That's for Sylvie. And I, Sylvie, do you want to like drop your website or something? Yeah. So my website is www.mysexandsensibility.com. And the E is the normal way in the website. And it's only a three on Instagram because Zuckerberg sucks. But apart from that, yeah. <laughs> That's why I get shadow banned all the time. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> if you can't find us on Instagram, that's why. Yeah. You just have to spell it all out and then it will show up. But that's how you know you shot a bat. So thank you again, listeners. And until next time, claim your pleasure, own your body and stay in presence. Bye.